Well, good evening, everybody. Let's uh, open in prayer and we'll get into the large group teaching. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for our continued study here in Ephesians. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the wisdom of Paul as he now shifts towards uh, telling the new believers what their life should look like if they are truly believers in Christ. And Lord, uh, we too can learn so much from Paul's words, and I pray that you give me uh, the wisdom to put the words in my mouth that you would have these folks here. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, consider the life of John Newton. This was an Englishman who was born in 1725 to a God-fearing mother and a merchant sea captain father. Her mother poured herself into young John and just uh, buried him in godly teaching through the first seven years of her life when she tragically then died of tuberculosis. But by age 11, he was going on sea voyages with his father. He had totally abandoned any religious interest that he had learned from his mother. By 18, he joined the Royal Navy. He didn't like it and tried to desert, was caught and then relieved of his standings and he was placed on board of a passing slave ship that was headed back to England. He became so enamored with the life of a slave trader that he then made that his, his occupation. He worked his way up to captain by the time he was 23 years of age. He had stirrings of a renewal. And he talked about remembering some of the things that his mother had told him about Christ when he was young. And these stirrings took place while he was steering one of his slave ships that was foundering in a terrible storm. And he thought he surely was going to die. And he committed that if he survived, that he would return to the faith that his mother had taught him at an early age. As his faith matured and he got older, he suddenly, his life changed. He became disenchanted with the whole concept of slavery. And he basically formed something called the Society for Affecting Slavery Society. I'm sorry, the Society for Affecting the Ab Ab Abolition of the Slave Trade, and more commonly called the Anti-Slavery Society. And ultimately, it was this organization that caused Parliament to pass laws to outlaw any type of slave, slave trade or slavery in their country. But Newton's most famous contribution may have been his writing, and his writing of one of the most famous hymns of all time, called Amazing Grace. An amazing grace which had characterized his life. And if you remember the first stanza, it says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And that's what Paul is talking about tonight in this message. He's dealing directly with the issue of God's grace in the Ephesians' lives, just like it did in John Newton's life. Specifically, the Ephesian believers used to be lost, and they had lived very ungodly lives. But now they had been saved, and Paul wants them to understand how that saving grace would change their lives and more importantly, continue to change their lives as they matured in their spiritual walk, to prepare them for the good works that God had set aside for them beforehand, that they should walk in them. Our scripture passage tonight is Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, and I've entitled it A New Way of Life, and I've broken it into three specific sections. First, Ephesians 4, 17 to 19, saying no to the old life. Secondly, Ephesians 4, 20 to 24, in Christ alone. And then finally, Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, as we start this passage tonight, it's worth going back and kind of looking a little bit of what we've studied. Paul has already urged the Ephesian believers to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they have been called not the easiest task in the city of Ephesus. Think about what they had to deal with. It was the richest city in the Roman Empire, very heavily uh, traded trade route that ran all through Europe. It was had many philosophers that touted varying religious concepts. 
It had the temple of Diana or Artemis, which dominated the society with its decadent practices. And it also had the worship of Diana that had permeated the entire city. So every place that you went, there was always a reference to Diana. There was always a praise for Diana. And this is the backdrop in which Paul continues to encourage the new believers and remind them that they have been predestined to be adopted into God's family, that they would he would empower them through the Holy Spirit to stand up to this overt and covert sometimes persecution they would receive by standing for Christ in this city. And he reminds them that they couldn't combine the old life with the new life of Christianity. There was a distinct and marked difference that needed to mark their lives. They were to be renewed, it says, by God's workmanship. They were being made more and more in the likeness of Jesus within this church at Ephesus. And Paul wanted them to walk in that manner when they traversed the city of Ephesus, not to try to blend the two together. And if you remember, when we first started studying Ephesians, many of the Ephesian believers said, okay, this is great. I'll add Christianity to my worship of Diana. And Paul is saying, absolutely not. This is a different and distinct life that is completely different than the way you used to live and walk. They've now been regenerated, and they're more like Christ, and their life should manifest this new lifestyle. He says, if you're a son or a daughter of Christ, then there are standards that are going to be followed. And there is a behavior that will testify to that belief. New life, new lifestyle. And again, if you recall from a few weeks ago when we talked about this, Paul was emphasizing that this new Ephesian church was going to be a light in a dark world. And in order for it to be attractive, it had to be different than the surrounding community. It had to be appealing to those that looked and said, how are all those people getting along of different backgrounds, of different races, free and, and slave, rich and poor, all worshiping together? How can that be? I'm curious. I'm interested. And Paul's saying, we don't want to disturb that. That's the, the message. That's the light that we want to send out to the surrounding community. And he lets them know that he's speaking on behalf of God. We talked about that as well, that, that Paul's letter is basically scripture. This is what Jesus inspired Paul to write so that they would know how to live as a Christian. He talks about the futility of their minds being darkened in their understanding. He's referencing those non-believers that are still in Ephesus. And again, he's saying, think about it, folks. You used to be like that. You used to walk that way. You used to be oblivious to what it meant to be saved. But I came and talked to you about Christ. The Holy Spirit softened your heart so you understood it. And now you're no longer a people that reject the gospel and think of themselves as enlightened. Right? It's the same as today. Don't you talk to people that where you see their hearts are darkened and that their, their, their intellect is used in such a way that is, is folly, but they don't know it. They'll say things to you like, well, you're so shallow minded or Jesus was a good man and a prophet, but a savior? I don't think so. How could anyone rise from the dead? That's silliness, right? They're ignorant, but they're not unintelligent. It's their intelligence is wasted when they reject the gospel, but their hard heartedness doesn't allow them to see the same things that these new believers in Ephesus did. So they've rejected the gospel. And what Paul wants them to do is live a life that is worthy of their new calling so that they can be a testimony to these people that currently have a hardened heart because God's ultimate purpose was to bring more and more people to him. So what does it mean to be a Christ follower? So Paul is going to unpack that for him. And if you recall, when we started studying Ephesians, we said the first three chapters were going to be preparation. So it told them about what their, their uh, history was, that God had selected them before the foundations of the world had been laid. He had selected them to be separate and distinct. He explained what Christ was and how he would die for their sins and make them new persons and how that he would reconcile the sin from Adam back to God so that they could be united with him. He said he would send them the Holy Spirit and that this would be a tremendous power source for them to draw upon in order to live these new godly lives. Now he's pivoting. 
Now, as we go into chapter four and beyond, he's starting to talk about, I told you all of this in the first three chapters so that you now understand what it means to be a Christian and how you would live. And not only how you should live, but how you should live using this power of the Holy Spirit that's available to you as a believer. That's what he wants them to understand means to be a Christ follower. You've been rescued from the world's present order of insecurity, of pride, of sinful activities. And you've been made and adopted into God's family as children of God, as children of God. This miraculous change should yield a miraculous result in your life. Think about um, the story of Zacchaeus. And if you go back and look in Luke, you can see about it. But if you recall what happened with Zacchaeus, he was living a life that was despised by the people, both Roman citizens, but also the Jews in, in which Rome kind of ruled. And why did they hate these tax collectors of which Zacchaeus was one so much? Because they were given a quota of how much money they should raise, but then there were no boundaries. If they wanted to double that and put the balance into their pocket, Rome didn't care. And they were notorious for stealing from these people. But yet Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus. And Zacchaeus was a small man and climbed a tree as Jesus was coming into the city of Jericho. And, and his heart was curious and his heart had softened. So the point when Jesus stopped underneath the sycamore tree and looked up and he said, hey, get down here. I'm coming to your house today. Zacchaeus could have said, I'm fine up here. I'm fine. I don't need to come down. My heart, my heart is still hardened. I've heard what you've said, but it doesn't have any impact on me. But he wasn't. He was pricked by what Jesus was saying, and he went to his house, and he received Christ and became a Christian. And what did he do? He said, you know what? I've cheated people. Here's the transformation that takes place. This is what Paul wants them to understand. Your heart now is in a different place. And what did Zacchaeus do? He said, you know, if I've stolen from anybody, I'm going to repay them double what I took from them. And in, in addition to that, I'm going to take half of this ill-gotten gain that I have and the wealth that I have, and I'm going to give it to the poor. Now, that's a fascinating story, but I think what's more fascinating is conjecture. Think of the stories told by his friends down at the tax collector's club, right? There was a little stool for Zacchaeus to sit on each day when he got done robbing the people. Probably had a little ladder next to it for him to climb up because he was a little guy, but suddenly he's not there anymore. And the people sitting around are saying, hey, where's Zacchaeus been? And somebody else says, hey, didn't you hear? He got religion. He's, he's now a Christian. And, and he no longer wants to associate with this tax collector. And you know what he's doing? He's giving money back to people. And the people shook their heads and said, what, are you kidding me? This, it took him this long to get wealthy and buy that beautiful house he has. What has gotten into him? Well, I'll tell you what's gotten into him. Christ has gotten into him. And that's the transition Paul is trying to, to emphasize to these Ephesian believers that your life is going to be now a beacon to those people that used to know you as one of their own, who used to do the same things that they do, but now are distinct and different. And they're going to be curious as to why. And they're going to look at it and do one of two things. They're going to be attracted to the light or they're going to be repulsed by it. But your job is to be that beacon to attract them. That's what Paul wants them to understand. You were once a great sinner, but God is a great savior. So now that you've been saved by his grace, don't walk like you used to. What does that mean? Don't do the things you used to do. Don't do the sinful things that were normal or natural in your life. Their decision of a non-believer was to reject Christ and the God that you have received. So what does that look like when you don't, you, you remember what it was like, Ephesian believers? It's callous. You've given yourself up to sensuality. You're greedy to every practice and every kind of impurity. That means you did what you thought was right in your own mind. You didn't care about other people. You only cared about yourself. That's the old you. That's what I want you to forget. Basically, a general description of what life looks like outside of Christ. That's everything that these Gentiles are doing now. And you used to be like them. But because of the grace of God, you're now saved. Don't get sucked back into that type of lifestyle. We talked a little bit about this in our group tonight. Why would that have been such an imperative for Paul to say that? Well, if you think about it, these are new Christians. 
right? There's not a class that they go to to say next steps in your Christian life. There wasn't someone that took them aside and said, hey, let me mentor you into what it means to be a Christian. This letter was their mentorship. So all they knew is they now had Christ in them and didn't fully understand what that meant. So Paul takes the time to sit down and write a letter and, and explain, here's what happened, and here's the result of what should happen if there's a true salvation in your heart. And that's the same for us today as well. Our lives should be radically different than what they were prior to us being a Christian. You know, there is an ancient uh, philosopher uh, named Horace, and he was the leading Roman lyric poet during the time of Augusta and, and the, Augustus in the first century. And he used to teach students in the writing of dramatic plays. And he had one non-negotiable. He said, a God can't be introduced into the action of a story unless the plot has become so tangled and twisted that only a God can unravel it. Now, he was talking about the mythical gods, the Zeuses of the world or the Artemises of the world. But what Paul is telling the Ephesians, the plot in Ephesus and for that matter, in Fairfield, is in such a tangle that only the living God, Jesus, can untangle a life that is away from him. And that's what he wants these people to understand. So as we move forward in the passage, Paul continues his theme as we move further into this section. His main point to the Ephesians continues to be, without that life in Christ, or excuse me, continues to be that life in Christ is starkly different than life without Christ. Whether it's class or creed or race or status is immaterial. This is a new life that all can enjoy in Christ. You are brothers and sisters when you believe. And a believer should know they're different from a non-believer. Just look at chapters one to three in his letter. It talks about all the things that God has done for them. They're no longer in this world of their old self and the non-believer. They are distinct and apart. Paul said, you know why that's true? It's because you learned Christ. That's his words. And that's more than Paul just sitting down and explaining to them what it means to be a Christian. That's the Holy Spirit moving in their heart. That's the Holy Spirit having them confess their sins. That's the Holy Spirit interpreting scripture for them to understand what is taking place. That's what he means about learning Christ. It's more than just an intellectual understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done, but it's to understand all of the attributes of Christ, his love, his peace, his joy, his righteousness, his holiness. All of those are things that mean to learn Christ. And it's the same for us as well. The more we dig into the Bible, the more we learn Christ. We understand what are the characteristics of Christ that we are now trying to emulate with the help of the Holy Spirit. Paul says you heard him and you, you were taught in him. You heard through the teachings of the apostles. They found the truth in Jesus and then they shared it. And the Ephesian believers heard and embraced all that was in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says it like this. So as in Adam, there was sin, all die. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. As a result, we are no longer in Adam, but we are now adopted into Christ's family. So in Christ, there is righteousness and holiness. That's what he's trying to impart to these believers. You can't put sin into this mix. Once you're a believer, sin and, and this, this new lifestyle are incompatible. And obviously, they can't do this on their own. They're going to need that dynamic power of the Holy Spirit that now is indwelling in them to execute on these, these things that Paul is outlining for them. Paul is saying you once walked in Adam when you were living like these unsaved Gentiles, these Ephesians that aren't believers are doing. And this isn't new information to you folks. You heard it from me when I was there teaching and living with you. But now I'm telling you, you have to put off that old self, that old way of life. It's a renewed spirit of mind, and you have to put on a new self. That's what he's telling them to do. And why is he telling them this? Is because they were backsliding. They were slipping back into old habits and saying, yeah, but you know what? I go to this church here and, and, and on Sundays I, I put on this new stuff 
but during the rest of the week, I'm going to just wear my old clothes. Paul's saying, no, you put that away for good. And now you go forward and you live as if you are a Christian with the standards that are being outlined here. And when he talks about putting off the old self, he's saying it's a renewed spirit of mind. You, you, a heart that was used to be deceitful above all things and sensual and greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's what you used to be like. But then he uses the phrase, and then renewed spirit of mind. So you have this action of throwing off the old way of living and now renewing your mind. And that's an entire transformation of the believer's inner selves. Remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks when we talked a couple of weeks ago when it said, you're now in Christ. That means Christ's attributes now are permeating your body. What used to be occupied by the old self now is being permeate, permeated by the Holy Spirit and regenerating your life. And a process in which believers begin to think in new and right ways as they meditate on the truth of God's word with the help of the Holy Spirit. So you see the transition? You go from the old self, which is the way that the unbelievers are living, and now renew your mind with all of the things of Christ, and now you put on the new self that believers are created anew in Christ. They're created after the likeness of God. What original creation was supposed to be like. And Paul is kind of pulling his hair out saying, why would you want to go back to that old stuff that is normal for the unbeliever? You're no longer in that world. You no longer have that zip code. You live in a new location with a new believer. And he's quick to say, if there's no evidence of change, there's no reason to believe that your conversion is real. And I think that's true for us as well. James says, faith without works is dead. If you have transitioned and your life has been transformed, it should be evident. People should see it. People should see the light that's in your life that is different, just as Zacchaeus's imaginary friends did. You've gone from futility to one with a brand new identity and destiny of righteousness. Isn't that great? You're, you have a guaranteed assurance of eternal life in heaven. That's the transition that Paul is describing here. And as he goes into the final verses, he says, so don't grieve the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, Paul emphasizes that the putting off and putting on for a believer is worked out on a daily basis. It's not this magic switch that is flipped and suddenly you're now a Christian and everything's fine and you don't have to do anything. No, in essence, he's saying you have to pursue the righteousness and the holiness of God every day. That's the way you become more and more sanctified. That's the way you become more and more like Christ. The behavior of the believer has to be consistent with the new person they've become. They can't go back to where they once were and be comfortable. The believer is now united or married, if you will, to Christ. They've been redeemed, they've been raised, and they've been sealed with him. An entirely new person, a transformation, if you will. And temptation is still there when we're Christians. I think we all know that. But the law of God shows us how sinful we are and our need for a Savior. It's kind of a barometer for us to say, wow, I used to not care about what that the Old Testament the law said, but now I do, because I understand that that's a guideline for how a Christian should be living. And we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit to subdue and enable us to do freely and joyfully what the law of God says we should do. That's the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. Being saved says, I walk in freedom because I obey your laws. And if we get that wrong, if we don't understand that, if we don't yield to that, then that screws up a lot of things in our lives. So Paul now explains what this new uniform that they're wearing, they have put on looks like. He's saying, he starts with the concept of not lying. Think about that. He's writing to believers and saying, don't lie. Why? Because that was the old lifestyle. And that hadn't totally been purged out of their lives. But Paul realized that if they continued to lie, there would be no foundation of trust within the church, and the whole thing would collapse underneath the weight of this deception that was taking place. In earlier chapters, Paul had emphasized this point of unity of the church, and that unity is based, is based on the members trusting one another. In contrast, the false teachers and the non-believing Ephesians weren't troubled by lying. 
It was their way of life. Secondly, he warns the Ephesians about their anger issues, about the right kind of things. He says, you can be angry, but don't sin when you're angry. Well, that's got to be a unique concept. I used to get things accomplished. When I would get angry, people would take notice. They would understand that I was mad and they didn't want to you know, be under the wrath of my anger. So he's basically saying, you know what? You can't be angry. The blatant evil should make every believer intolerant. And you can get angry about that, but just don't sin. Well, what's he talking about that? Well, maybe he's talking about issues like human trafficking. Maybe he's talking about issues about abortion. Maybe he's talking issues about, you know, kind of uh, racial persecution. All of those things, you can get angry about it, but you can't sin when you're angry. That's the difference. Anger now doesn't have a place unless it's 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 modeled by, by being able to control that anger. But what Paul still is focused on here is the former life where, ha where people would have an unrighteous type of anger a wrongful reaction to inconsequential things. What is in the heart when anger controls the actions? That's what he's asking. Them. Do you have Christ in your heart? Are you in Christ? Is the Holy Spirit there modulating your anger? Or is it just kind of blown out of proportion and you don't even think about kind of, I have a new life, I've been transformed. So what's in your heart when you're cut off on the merit? <laughs> That's what he's asking. Right? It is, you know, do you still blow up and shake a fist and yell and chase the guy down? Or do you sit there and say, you know what? I'm a new creation. My heart's been changed. There was a uh, commentator that said it like this He that will be angry and not sin, let him be angry at nothing but sin. And I think that's a great benchmark for us to look at. Paul is very aware that righteous anger can lead to sin. And indignation at sin itself can become sin. The believer verbally attacks the person opposing their stance on certain issues. You don't believe that. You're saying, well, that would never happen to me. Have you ever had an amicable discussion about who should be our next president with the opposing view? <laughs> Think about how you know the reactions take place when, when you're having those conversations. Paul then turns his attention to stealing. Now think about that. He's talking to believers in the church about stealing. In Ephesus, there was no welfare system. Stealing was prevalent for some people to provide for their family. So here you have a new congregation where you have a poor person who the only way he was able to feed his family was to steal. Now he has a new heart. Now he is in Christ. Now he is throwing off the old, and yet he still has a family to feed. What's he supposed to do? Well, Paul covers that. He says, instead of stealing, work to get what you need to support your family and also make enough to give to the poor that are unable to work. Do you see how this congregation was supporting itself? So you had some wealthy individuals that said, you know, that poor guy there that used to steal bread for his family, I'm now going to buy that bread for him because we are brothers, we are in Christ. Do you think that might have had an impact in Ephesus to people that were looking at that saying, rich guy hang out with a poor guy and buying him bread when he doesn't even know him and he's not related to him? What's going on there? I'm interested. I want some of that. I think back to when I was younger, there used to be two offerings that would take place in our Sunday service. One would be for the general maintenance of the building and support of the missionaries. But then there was always a second one after the communion service, and that was dedicated for the poor. That's the way the church took care of their own. Even if there were poor people, there was, there was sustenance there to be able to help. Final thing Paul talks about is he calls it corrupting talk. He said, you got to get rid of the corrupting talk that you've had going on about you and that you used to have. Corruption, the word here refers to rotting fruit or putrid fish. Nice visual. That's what he's talking about. You, you got to replace that kind of talk. No longer is that the way you engage or communicate with people. Instead, I want you to have constructive speech. Use only good, upbuilding talk should come out of your mouth. What is kind? What is true? What is necessary? What is seasoned with grace? That's what he wants you to do. And oh, by the way, I don't want you to gossip anymore either. Right? Do you see how he is taking them out of an old way of life and saying, this is what it means to follow Christ? 
This is what it means to be saved and to aspire to have the attributes of Christ working in your life with the power of the Holy Spirit transitioning you from the old life into the new life. Paul knows that the church could never be a witness or a beacon in the darkness of the city of Ephesus if the church tolerated the same stuff that was going on in the world. Somebody comes into that church and people are doing all these things, backbiting, gossiping, lying to one another, stealing. And they would say, well, why would I believe that there is a God that changes these people if they're doing the same stuff that I see every day when I go to work? And isn't that true today as well? Are you a beacon in your environment when you go out or are you still hanging on to the old self and doing some of the things that Paul is telling us here to put away? And Paul turns his final attention to the grieving and sealing of the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? Well, God gave us the Holy Spirit to dwell in our life. To grieve the Holy Spirit means to cause him sorrow because of the sin that's in my life. Lying, corruptive talk, stealing, disunity, anger, all of those things grieve the Holy Spirit. Since like God, the Holy Spirit is holy, our sin causes him to be grieved and he's indwelling in us. Boy, it says he was sealed to the day of redemption. Well, what does that mean? We now have a new life in Christ. We're no longer like we once were. We received the Holy Spirit when we were saved and are sealed and forgiven in Christ. Boy, that's a great thing to know. But we're also sealed to the day of redemption. What does that mean? Well, that means the day when Christ returns. So the Holy Spirit doesn't come when we're saved and then kind of sits back and does nothing. No, he's helping us as we become more and more sanctified, more and more like Christ in this new belief that we now have in our lives. That's the power that is within us for us to access so we can put away all of these things that Paul is talking about. He wants the believers to understand that the Holy Spirit is in our heart to convict us of sin. So when we struggle with this old way of life, when we're tempted to go back to the same things that we were comfortable when we weren't saved, the Holy Spirit is there to say, ah, 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 new life, new belief, new system, new mind, new way of walking. Those are all the convictions that the Holy Spirit is giving to us if we are willing to listen. Our lives should be seasoned with grace because of our appreciation for what God has done for us. Kindness should replace bitterness which often causes all of the other sins. Bitterness comes from a heart that's not right before God and is characteristic of an unregenerate person. That's what Paul doesn't want these people to be. He has zero tolerance for behavior that would, that would tarnish the testimony of the church. He gives some examples in the final verse. Talks about wrath. It's just the flaring up of passion. He talks about anger sullen hostility, and smoldering resentment. He talks about clamor, speaks of a loud, aggravational assertion from an angry person who wants everyone to know it. He talks about malice. Bitterness concealed turns into malice that is viewed. The intention or desire to do evil and ill will. Paul wants the Ephesians to replace all of these things with kindness, Christ-like, and tenderheartedness, forgiving one another. Think of the Good Samaritan parable, where this person was injured and robbed and beaten, and none of the religious order would help him. But here was his enemy, ones that were considered dogs, a Samaritan comes by and helps him. That's the attitude Paul wants to see engendered into these new believers. And when the infusion, uh, the Ephesian church gets this right, Satan will never get a foothold in their lives. He is a defeated foe. He prowls around trying to get into our lives to make us do these things, but not if we are consistently looking for the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us and are consistently saying, I used to live that way, but I don't anymore. So Satan, you have no place in my life. Ordinary people enabled by the Holy Spirit can live in an extraordinary way as a result of the grace and goodness of God. That's what Paul wants these Ephesians to understand. So what do we take from this? There's a lot of great information here, but what really struck with me was putting off of the old, regenerating the mind, and then putting on the new. That's what stuck with me. I read a story, this was years ago, 
about baptism. And it was a church that practiced baptism outside of their structure and did it at a river that was nearby. And again, if you're not familiar with baptism, baptism, baptism is saying publicly that I now am a follower of Christ. And it's pu the public assent of this is how I used to live and this is how now, since I've been saved, I want to live. And what this church did was they were very much into the symbolic nature of this baptism. And what the pastor would say to these people is when you are baptized, there's going to be a group of people that are going to be there supporting and watching you. Give them a tangible example of what you are doing. So they would read their testimony about what these people used to be like and what they struggled with. And then there was a tangible enactment of what they were giving up as they left their old life. And here are some examples of what took place. Excuse me. After they tangibly left behind what their old life was like, they then on the other side had white robes that were given to them, and they would walk out now with the symbolism of a new life that was free from, from the sin that used to hold them. But what, what I found so interesting is here were some examples of what they would do. So one man walked in, and he had a $2,000 Hickey Freeman suit. And he said, I used to only live for my business. I don't want to do that anymore. And he stripped off the jacket and the pants and threw them into the river and got his white robe. Behind him was a lady that had a beautiful cocktail dress and high heels and walked into the water and stripped it off and said, this is how I used to live. I used to be only about my possessions and only about my looks. And I don't want to do that anymore. That's my old life. There was a, a young kid that walked in with a phone and threw it into the river. And he said, I used to watch pornography on that. That was my old life. I want to move forward into a new life. <clears throat> there was a guy who came in with a bottle and they said he threw it as far as you could imagine. And he said, I, had, uh, I was an alcoholic and that had a grip on me. I no longer want to live like that. Another guy came in with a fistful of money and he threw it into the river. And he said, I had an obsession with making money. It was all about money. I didn't care about anything else. That was my old life. I don't want to live like that anymore. Now, can you imagine people that were sitting on the, on the, 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 the shores of that river watching that take place? Can you imagine the guy in the fishing boat downriver when he saw all this stuff drifting down? <laughs> but, but think of the symbolism that it meant. This is exactly what Paul is talking about, right? It isn't wrong to be successful in business or to have nice clothes or to have money, but it is if that what drives your life. And when we receive Christ, our lives are recalibrated with him as our highest priority. Then all our actions going forward from there flow from that point. If there's no change in your life, once you become a Christian, then you have to reconsider the conversion experience. Imagine the example of the baptized man who said, I'm leaving all this behind, then going back into the, into the river and retrieving his suit and putting it back on. It would defeat the purpose of what his life change was. And Paul tells the Ephesians, the old way of life is gone. It's not commingled, it's gone. A radical transformation takes place with Jesus as the highest priority in every aspect of your life and their life and the life of the aggregate church should reflect that new life in unity only enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, as I read this, this is written to new believers, but the application is to us as mature believers as well. What would you leave behind in the water as you embark on this new life with Christ? as the highest priority. What has been hanging on, even though you, you, you are a Christian and you follow Christ, there's this nagging thing that holds on. Let it go. What is it in your life that continues to pull you back into that old lifestyle? Paul would say, get rid of the old, regenerate your mind, and look to the new life in Christ, and he will reward you for that. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these great words from Paul. We thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> they cut deep into our lives as well, that there are things, Lord, that we hang on to, that even though we profess Christ, we would look at that and say, you know, that's a sinful activity. Or even if it's not sinful, it's occupying so much of my time that I could be doing more with you. Lord, let me release that. Let me get on with a new life and get a white robe that I can wear that symbolizes a new life that is committed to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen.